When we remember a time, we remember moments. A kaleidoscope of the sights, the sounds, the emotions that remind us of the way we were. It's about time. Tonight, Liberation Summer, 1944. Here are Linda Ellerby and Ray Gandall. For the next hour, think of your television set as a time machine. Destination, occupied Paris. Obstacle, the Germans. Welcome to the summer of 1944. It's an exciting time. At the front and on the home front, there's a feeling that this summer will be the last summer of war. And soon the phrase, an American in Paris, will be more than a Gershwin title. Sure, Paris is a long, dangerous way from Normandy Beach, but when we say we're all in this together, we don't mean in spirit only. So let the journey begin. Eighty days elapsed from D-Day to the day Charles de Gaulle marched down the Champs-Élysées in a free Paris. Eighty days in which the course of the war in Europe changed when the Allies tore away pieces of the French countryside from the Nazi claw and return them to their rightful owner. But we're not going to talk much about the fighting men tonight. This is the story of their support troops, the non-combatants, the men and women who went to war carrying typewriters and cameras, donuts and coffee, cracking a joke and singing a song. It was slow going that summer on all fronts, mile by bloody mile. But it was an advance, and town by town, the French were being liberated. And right behind the GIs, sometimes beside them, came the support systems, the Red Cross, the entertainers, and the correspondents who chronicled it all, every step of the way. They started on D-Day, the 6th of June. In OWI-2, flash. Supreme Headquarters announces Allies begin operations on northern coast of France. People of Western Europe, a landing was made this morning on the coast of France. Supported by strong air forces. Began landing. The large planes continued their bombing in what the dispatch calls... ...that is being done by thousands of men. They are living in it, and they are ready to die in it. 176,000 assault troops landed on the Normandy beaches on D-Day. So did 28 correspondents and photographers. About 30 more followed within a week. Movie director George Stevens was in the first wave, and he recorded some of what you'll see tonight with his color camera. Stevens was followed a few days later by cub reporter Andy Rooney. I came in D4 into the beach area in Normandy. I was 23 years old and I was with the Army newspaper, the Stars and Stripes, lucky to be there too. I had been within an artillery outfit and I was transferred to the Army newspaper. There were anywhere from 20 to 30 correspondents traveling with the many divisions of the First Army at all times. Over there, over there, send the word, send the word, over there. And they had facilities for us. We would take over a chateau, and three or four enlisted men would fix it up, and we would use the dining room and uh, other rooms for as a press room. And uh, we, as correspondents, lived in the tents on the way to Paris. And we won't come back till it's over over there. The good ones told us what happened and how and why. Columnist Ernie Pyle, Charles Collingwood of CBS, A.J. Liebling of The New Yorker. Jack Lieb, a cameraman for News of the Day, took home movies of the press entourage. They have never been shown on television before. Lieb and his fellow newsreel cameramen shot the war the way it was. By the time their footage got to your local movie house, it was heavily edited and dressed with celestial narration. At exactly noon, in observance of July 4th, America's Independence Day, 
every United States gun in Normandy will send a shell crashing into the enemy. Well, maybe so. And maybe you had to be there if you wanted to know what was going on. John Wilhelm covered the American advance for Reuters. The Army would come in and set up a regular mess and a motor pool, so we'd have vehicles and gasoline uh, to get about. We were allowed to go just about anywhere we wished. We'd take our vehicle and go. Larry Lasseur covered the Normandy invasion for CBS Radio. You would go out from the press camp in the morning to any place where you thought there might be something worth seeing, worth reporting, first checking with the intelligence to see where the actions were, and then coming back that evening to write your story and for me to make my broadcasts. We would write our copy on our knees or in a jeep or in the dining room of the chateau, and uh, we would take it to press wireless, and they would transmit it. The Germans contested the advance every foot of the way through Normandy. But the Allies broke out of Saint-Lô on July 25th, entered Brittany on August 1st, and drove toward Paris. Liberation summer was at hand. There was no shortage of stories along the way. German soldiers who were now German prisoners of war. A good story. French people, who are now free French people, a better story. Pictures had their own war stories to tell, and so did those who made them. Associated Press photographer Harry Harris talks about associating with press photographers. There was a true camaraderie. It, it, it came from the fact that weeks of traveling, living in tents, moving equipment, the writer's problem of transmitting their stories, picture problem there, getting our pictures back to London. That was the central point. We helped each other. Puffs of heavy flak, each a sign of potential death. We dropped bombs from the sky to clear a path for those on the ground. Reporters watched the bombs fall from front row seats and what they saw, they wrote, and what they wrote, we read. In midsummer, more bombs were dropped, a wider path was cleared. Even if it meant destroying what we'd come to save, it prompted one GI to remark, we sure liberated the hell out of that place. The fight for France had become a desperate, deadly match. No one was safe, being a civilian wouldn't help, neither would being a reporter. We had the horror there of having one of us killed there, just trying to photograph the bombing just before Paris. It's just that they stuck their necks out to get a story and to get a picture. We had about 18 casualties among the correspondents until we got to the outskirts of Paris. And then we were sobered up particularly by the fact that one of the men we were very fond of was named Bill Stringer. Uh, he was an American who worked for Reuters. And he had just simply gone out on one of these jeep trips I'm telling about, and uh, he ran into a German ambush, and uh, uh, a, a, a shell, a cannon shell, went through their windshield and right through Bill's chest. It was easier to smile if you kept your mind on other things, like Paris. The last time I saw Paris, her heart was warm and gay. But if some of these soldiers would never see Paris, it was because soldiers were out front. Following the leader was more restful, as is revealed here by Jack Lieb's camera and the gentlemen of the press. Bob Kappa, photographer for life, temporarily among the tourists. Ernest Hemingway, temporarily among the war correspondents, drinker for life. The medieval town of Rambouillet. Paris is only 30 miles away now and will soon be liberated, but not by Americans.